the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle had a proof that division by zero is impossible. This proof was wrong, but it's still interesting to see how Aristotle managed to come up with a proof at all, and specifically what is wrong with it. Aristotle lived from 384 to 322 BC. He may have looked something like this carving. In Aristotle's time, mathematics and physics were at an early stage of development. In particular, the notion of a number wasn't well developed. For example, Aristotle didn't believe that one is a number. Nonetheless, Aristotle could count. He could count one, two, three, and so on. He could imagine counting up to an arbitrarily large number, which I've written as C sub i, the ith count. Aristotle had ratios of his counts, so he could have the ratio of 1 to 2, 2 to 1, 3 to 6. He would have done fine at the races. Aristotle didn't have zero, but he did have the notion of a vacuum. Aristotle wrote a book on physics. I've written Aristotle's law of motion as V equals F over D as an equation in modern mathematical notation. Aristotle didn't do it that way, he just described the relationship in words. Newton did the same thing. Newton didn't write down force equals mass times acceleration, he just described the relationship in words, and today we write that down as the equation F equals ma. If we're willing to write down Newton's ideas in mathematical notation, we should be willing to do the same for Aristotle not least because Newton was following the ancient geometers and philosophers. In particular, he was following the methodology of Aristotle and Aristotle's physics. So if we're willing to write down equations for Newton, we should do the same for Aristotle. When I write V velocity equals F force over density D, V and F are vector quantities. The ancient Greeks hadn't yet come up with the idea of a vector, and nor Newton. Newton's physics depends on vectors, but he splits the idea up into a direction and a magnitude. Newton specifies which straight line a motion takes place on, and then he describes how much motion there is using a scalar number. So when I write for Aristotle V equals F over D, I understand that there is some unspecified direction. And what we're manipulating here is scalar numbers V, F and D. In particular, as Aristotle didn't have negative numbers, V, F and D are all positive. This equation provides a common touch point between Aristotle and us. Aristotle didn't have fractions. He didn't believe that fractions were numbers, but he did have ratios. Aristotle could understand V equals F over D as relating velocity to a ratio F to D, but he couldn't understand it as a fraction. So on Aristotle's side, when he reads this equation, he reads it in his own terms as relating some speed to a ratio. When we read this equation, we read it in our terms. We see f over d as a fraction, or we see f over d as a transreal number. The equation allows us to translate from Aristotle's notions into modern notions, so we can apply modern understanding of mathematics and physics to Aristotle's notions in a way that would be very hard to do if we just took Aristotle's words. It would be very hard to do for Newton if we just took Newton's words. We need to translate into modern mathematical notation so that we can manipulate it. So the situation Aristotle is describing is like this. Imagine you throw a stone into air. You throw it with some force. That force is F. The air has some density, which is recorded as D. You know that air has some density because you can feel the wind 
when you throw the stone, it moves at some speed, which is proportional to the force. The harder you throw it, the faster it goes, and inversely proportional to the density of the medium you're going through. Air has a very low density, so, it's n so the stone isn't slowed down much. If the stone goes into water, water has a much higher density, and the stone is slowed down a lot. Aristotle's law of motion is wrong, uh, but it survived for a long time. It survived into the 17th century. So it survived for about 2,000 years. That's a pretty good run. Now, Aristotle thinks about what would happen if you threw a stone into a vacuum. A vacuum has no density. And we record that as density equals zero. Aristotle didn't have the number zero. He couldn't say density equals zero, but he could say no density. So when Aristotle is describing what happens in a medium of no density, we understand it as describing what's happening in a medium of density equal to zero. Aristotle deduces that the speed of an object passing through a vacuum is faster than the speed of an object moving through any other medium. The reason is quite intuitive. Imagine throwing a stone into a medium which has some density, some density greater than zero. However fast the stone moves, it would move faster still if it were travelling through a vacuum. So in our terms, Aristotle deduces that the speed of an object in a vacuum, f over zero, is greater than the speed of an object in any other medium, f over d. And he draws a conclusion from that. He says it's absurd that there is a quantity bigger than every ratio, therefore division by zero is impossible. And in Aristotle's time, analysis of the texts that Aristotle wrote, I'll put a link in the description below, suggests that it was common knowledge that division by zero was impossible. Think about that. 300 BC, it's common knowledge that division by zero is impossible. The ancient Greeks were, of course, wrong on that point. Division by zero is possible. So what was Aristotle's error? His error was to say that it's impossible for f over zero to be bigger than every ratio. But we know from transreal arithmetic that that is precisely the case. f over zero equals one over zero, and that is bigger than every ratio of positive integers. I'll put an end card to the proof and a link in the description below. So since 300 BC, people have believed that division by zero is impossible. They're wrong on that point. And it would be a good idea if the world would catch up with mid 20th century mathematics. Aristotle is famous for his aphorism, nature abhors a vacuum. Aristotle meant that it's impossible for a vacuum to exist. And he had several reasons for this. One of them is quite intuitive. Imagine we have a vacuum and at the edge of the vacuum, something moves into the vacuum. It travels at infinite speed and therefore fills the vacuum in zero time. That was a persuasive argument in 300 BC, but it doesn't stand up to modern examination. Imagine we've got a vacuum, a sphere for simplicity. Its area is proportional to the radius squared. Its volume is proportional to the radius cubed. When a particle, say an atom, crosses the boundary of the vacuum into the vacuum, the density inside the sphere is inversely proportional to the radius. It goes as 1 over r. If the radius is big, the density is very small. If an atom crosses the boundary, and there's a very small density inside the vacuum, then most of the vacuum is perfect. It has no density. Now, the ancient Greek atomists existed 200 years before Aristotle. 
the atomists believe that atoms exist in a vacuum and move within the vacuum and occasionally they join together to make bigger things, which today we would call molecules. Aristotle is using precisely that notion, atoms moving in a vacuum, to argue that a vacuum is impossible. So Aristotle's notion of physics is inconsistent with the atomist's view of physics. Aristotle could have been criticised at the time he published his physics using the understanding of atoms that already existed in ancient Greek science. Now, there's, a, there's another problem with atoms. We know that atoms move at random with Brownian motion. Aristotle didn't know that. But that means that atoms, when they hit the boundary of the void, start off at all sorts of angles. Most of the particles will pretty quickly shoot sideways through the vacuum. Very few of them will go deep into the vacuum. So large parts of the vacuum will be completely empty. Now we could argue in Aristotle's favour and say that space is full of virtual particles and so there's always some density everywhere in space and we could come to his defence like that. The issue of physics, the way the universe works, is not really the point at hand. Aristotle was arguing from theoretical physics. He was arguing using mathematics. And if we imagine now a particle entering a vacuum, it moves at infinite velocity, so it leaves the vacuum on the other side after zero time. The particle jumps from the entry boundary to the exit boundary. Even if the vacuum has no real bound on its size, the topology of transreal space tells us it's, the particle still jumps from the boundary to infinity in zero time. It makes, the particle makes a quantal jump. It spends no time inside the vacuum, so it doesn't fill out the vacuum. And that's just a consequence of arithmetic. So Aristotle was wrong to say that a particle moving at infinite speed fills out a space. It doesn't. It jumps from the start point to the end point in zero time. So Aristotle's argument might have been convincing in 300 BC. It's not convincing today. If you're a native speaker of Greek and you also speak English and can divide by zero, I would love to hear from you. Send me an email and I'll arrange a Zoom call. We can chat about Aristotle, Greek mathematics, philosophy, whatever you like. And I would like you to spend more than 20 seconds saying who you are and you can divide by zero. I'll then add you to my playlists of people who can divide by zero.